Francisco to New York, New York to San Francisco in four days. I'll remind you how we got there. It was a president. A president named Abraham Lincoln. He had a vision. He set a goal. And he provided an incentive to meet that goal. In the midst of the Civil War, he had a vision of the United States connected from sea to shining sea by two bands of steel. Knowing the incredible, the incredible consequence of such an undertaking. We wanted to tie this nation together to see it grow and flourish as a single union. So what did he do? In order to encourage the construction and completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, he committed to provide $16,000 in the midst of the Civil War, $16,000 for every mile of track laid by a private to use the word you economists use to teach economy, economics, no company was able to do that. The externalities were beyond their capacity. Just the territorial externalities. It took a government to lay out the vision. No single enterprise had the capacity to cross state lines. Franklin Roosevelt had a vision. It set goals in the midst of the Depression. One of those goals was to electrify the nation, fundamentally changing the opportunity and economy of Americans forever with the, with the Tennessee Valley Authority and the electrical co-op system. It transformed America. It connected America with the rest of the world. It connected rural America with the rest of America. In 1944, he had a vision of America being the best educated nation in the world. And he laid out the means by which we get there. The United States decided it would provide for a, the greatest equalizer of the 20th century, the GI Bill. The GI Bill. Allowing Barack Obama's grandfather who fought in Patton's army to get a college education, which would have been on his reef, beyond his reef, had he not. Allowing my, my uncle Jack Finnegan, who was a registrar and had his PhD in, in psychology at the University of Scranton to teach there after serving in World War II. Virtually no possibility they would have been able to accomplish that without the GM. And more than that, allowing Irish Catholic kids like me to go to the elite universities in the country. Allowing Jewish kids to get by the quota that was set in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, letting them access the quote the most prestigious universities in the world. It was the single greatest equalizer in education. President Eisenhower was a He set a goal to construct the largest public works project in the history of the time, the interstate highway system. He knew it couldn't be completed in his term of office. He also knew when completed it would fundamentally transform American society. And it did. Whole new phrases came into the lexicon of American majority. The suburb. There was no such thing as the suburbs. Connected 50 states to the rivers of concrete to allow commerce to flow and flourish. He had a vision in the middle of the Sputnik crisis when he was president to move on what he called projects beyond the horizon. So he set up a thing called ARPA. Later became known as DARPA. In 1962, he launched a nationwide effort to build a computer network that became known as ARPANET. The federal government invested $25 million in this project. Because of those externalities, no single company or group of them was prepared to make that bet. The ARPANET is now the internet. Because of the president's vision, some seed money from the federal government, no private company with the capacity or willingness to invest. You all know the vision of John Kennedy. He challenged the nation to look at a totally new frontier, the moonshot. When you read his speech, it was not so much about putting a man on the moon, it was about generating 400,000 new engineers and scientists. He felt America was falling behind. 
so we do. The consequences of that effort guarantee the American remain the forefront of technology. But even the President could not imagine the consequences of that decision. I'll just give you one concrete example. Before the commitment to go to the moon, when a man on the moon was made, there was an emerging industry of semiconductors to produce them, producing semiconductors, the things that run electronics today. But these semiconductors were so expensive to produce, the industry was falling. The consequence of the commitment to put a man on the moon, the federal government purchased incredible amounts of semiconductors that they must get. Not only accommodate the meeting our goal of landing the man on the moon, but it had another impact. It brought down the cost of semiconductors, not just a little, it brought them down by 98% between 1960 and 1963. Suddenly, companies could afford to purchase them. There was a market for them. The semiconductors, from them, we got personal computers, digital cameras, smartphones. Or tablets. Companies like Microsoft, IBM, Apple, Google, Facebook, they're all the progeny of an initial investment with the government in this new technology. Laying out a vision and setting a goal for a country is uniquely in the purview of the President of the United States. Only a President has the capacity to do that for a nation. President Obama understands that, like other presidents. That's why we've set lofty goals for America. With the same confidence our predecessors had, that we can meet those goals if we unleash potential of the American people. Like Roosevelt, we believe we have to be the best educated nation in the world. So we've set a goal that by 2020, we will once again have the highest percentage of college graduates of any nation in the world. cheaper and more available. I love these guys. And supposedly, an expert on national security has asked me at a conference of national security experts, what's the single most significant thing we can do to maintain our security? The answer is simple. Be the best educated nation in the world. Increasing the number of students getting Pell Grants in college today from 6 million to 9 million. 3 million who would not be there today for the legislation. That's why we created the tuition tax credit. Provides for you, if you're on your own or your parents, up to $10,000 of a tax credit over four years. That's why we're capping payments on federal loans to 10% of your disposable income when you graduate. That's why we're investing unprecedented resources in early learning. That's why we've expanded Head Start and made it more demanding. That's why we've created the race to the top to challenge states to set high standards and create the circumstances where students can meet those standards. On energy, we've set a goal that by the year 2035, we'll generate 80% of our energy from clean energy, from renewable energy, from shale gas. That's why we set a goal we call the sunshine to make solar energy cost competitive with other forms of energy by the end of the decade. That's why, like Eisenhower, we've set up a new defense research entity called RPE, which focuses on basic research in the breathtaking energy technology. And that's why, on the healthcare front, we set a goal of being able to prevent and effectively treat Alzheimer's by the year 2025. Today, five million. Five million Americans suffer from It is expected that that number will double by the year 2040. But not if we meet our goal. An infrastructure 
want to give 80% of Americans access to high-speed rail by 2035. Ladies and gentlemen, I hear the voices of the same naysayers from 1865 when Lincoln was talking about connecting the nation by rail. How is it that we will be able to generate the business and commerce and the transport of the American people without, without high-speed rail. We think well, it has as transformative an impact on the American economy and the standard of living of the American people as the transcontinental railroad did. The transcontinental railroad would transform America at the time we believe, like we believe the same is true. But again, Imagination. You have to ask yourself the question, not only what if we do, what if we don't? Tell me what happens if we don't. Tell me when the population increases by another 50 million, how many more people we can put in the air? Tell me. Tell me what happens if we don't. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish some of our opponents would read and understand the history of the journey of this country. In each of these instances, in each of the instances that I've cited, the government not only set a goal and the means to accomplish, but in most of those cases provided seed money. Again, because as the economists say, there are certain externalities that prevent any one business enterprise or group of people from being able to do this on their own. And that's where we come in. We can start the process. Look, folks, the irony of all iron is that in order to reach these innovative changes, we really don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to invent a new model to accomplish these goals. We know what got us here. Laying out a vision, setting specific goals, committing to pursue those goals until they are met. This requires, now and always has required, being partners with and promoting the private sector. The private sector is the engine. It's transformed and only generated all of these things. I want to say one more thing. Just as each of the generations before us, the generations of innovation that produce breakthroughs in the standard of living, the health and security of the American people, it also produced good paying jobs. I ask you, where will those middle class jobs in the 21st century come from, if not from entire new industries, entire new enterprises? The automobile created a whole new industry. Henry Ford that led to steel production, that led to go through the roof. Both industries were able to create middle class jobs, including the infrastructure, building an interstate highway system. It caused significant increase in the production of steel, cement, highway equipment, heavy equipment, engineering services. And both of these things created good paying middle class jobs and professions, provided all the dignity that people were entitled to as Americans. Edison's invention of electric light bulb not only changed the way we live, but it spawned in incredible enterprises, large utility companies, General Electric, the list goes on and on and on. Places where people worked and they could raise a family, live in a decent neighborhood that's safe, send their kid to a decent school, be able to send them to college and take care of their parents in need, and have the hope that they, when they reach their parents' age, would not need help and dream. I come from Green Ridge and Scranton. My mother and father never doubted for a moment that their son Joe could be president or vice president of the United States. They never doubted. They dreamed. They never doubted that if my brothers decided to go in business, they couldn't be millionaires. I love these guys who tell us we are engaged in class warfare or class envy. Name me. Show me a middle class neighborhood in America, where not only did people think they were entitled if they worked hard enough to 
participating in production of the great things of this country. They can live in a decent home, but also, also, say to the children and meaning, you can aspire to be anything you want to be. And I said the moonshot generated close to 400,000 new engineers and scientists to put on a revolution revolutionized whole industries, not the least of which was, I said, the personal computing industry. Again, creating millions of jobs, decent jobs. We know that investing in clean, renewable energy, high-speed rail, modern infrastructure, the healthcare industry, to create high-paying, decent jobs in the 21st century, just as steel and rubber and other manufacturing entities provided in the 20th century. Where else? Your children when they graduate and their grandchildren find their way. There's only so many jobs on Wall Street. There's only so many jobs in investment banking. There's only so many of those jobs. Again, allowing any child who wants to aspire to do whatever they want. You know, that's how we did it before. But it's absolutely necessary we do it again because it's totally within our wheelhouse. I know that some of you are thinking, now I know why Biden referred to as the White House optimist. That's how I find myself referred to as the White House My grandfather said, that implies I you know, fell off the turnip truck yesterday. I've been there longer than all those folks. I am an optimist. I've been an optimist my whole life. But, how else? Studied so badly, he had to practice reciting Emerson as well as Yates in front of the mirror so he could control his face when he, what, when he stuttered and was so embarrassed. How else could a kid like me, a kid like Barack Obama, an incredible woman like Michelle or my wife, how else could we have ever aspired to the position? but for this upward path of mobility. And there's no path other than through the middle class. And the middle class does well, the poor have a chance and the wealthy do better. But I'm here to tell you, in conclusion, I'm more optimistic today about the prospects for this nation, the prospects for your generation, than I was when I was elected as a 29-year-old kid. There's a reason for that. It's not just genetic, like most people think. It's because, as I said, I know the history of the journey of this country. I know the naysayers have been wrong almost every single time. Let me just give you a recent example of that. Recent history. Say to you students, your parents were told in the 80s. Japan, Japan Incorporated, would dominate the world economy and outshine America. It did not happen. It did not happen. Your brothers and sisters, if you have older brothers and sisters, were told that the Asian Tigers, Hong Kong, South Korea, Singapore, and Taiwan were going to dominate the world economy relative to the United States. It did not happen. And now your generation is being told, if you listen to the naysayers, that China, China will dominate the world economy, eclipse America as the strongest economic engine of the world, be the country where breakthroughs, breathtaking breakthroughs occur. And they'll basically eat America's lunch. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you and had the time I would give you a chapter and verse why that would not happen. We need China to continue. We desperately need China to continue to go for domestic stability in China. It took them 30 years to get 20% of their population out of abject poverty. Their growth rate may be between 7.5% and 9%, but it's needed just to maintain basic stability. They need to produce 9 million urban jobs a year, 20 million jobs 
They've gone from a society, God love them, that has gone from a society that was overwhelming the agricultural now to 49 percent agriculture, the rest urban. Cities I recently visited with, Vice President Xi about to take control of China. Just 15 years ago, over 2 million are now 16 million. By the late 20s, they will have almost as many people retired as working because of their God of one child policy of the last two generations. Their problems are immense, staggering. <coughs> Comparison of It's important they succeed. The idea, the idea that you will, you will, as the ad shows on TV, that you will be the ones going to China is as likely as it was that I would have to move to Tokyo. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States, the United States, with all the reasons I feel many I'm not going to take the time to stay in this best position, but we can not sit still. Let me tell you what I tell world leaders. There's not a single world leader in the last 35 years I have not personally met, not because I'm important, because it's my job. And whenever we start talking, and they start telling me about their, their predictions about America, I point out the following, I say it, my reputation being one. I point out, I said, Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister, let me remind you, it's never, never, never been a good bet to bet against America. Never.